members do you have across the state? Uh, roughly about 200 uh, independent pharmacies. That many? Yes, and uh, yeah. there's roughly about 350 independent uh, pharmacies across the state. A lot of people, they think that uh, the chain drugstores mm -hmm. outnumber the independents, but it's pretty much a one-to-one a, a -one right there. Um, there are just as many independents as yeah. uh, chains out there. Hometown, plus or minus. hometown pharmacies are just, uh, I mean, that's part of the hometown they're, flavor, too. They're the best. They, they are. absolutely are. You know when you go in there. Yeah. Yeah. Miss Daisy's going to be in there day to day, or you know who they, those people are. That's right. And, you know, one thing, um, one important factor during the COVID uh, mm -hmm. pandemic, uh, when, when the nation went on lockdown and everybody went home, the independent pharmacists, uh, they, they stood their ground. They, they uh, held the line, and they, they uh, manned their post, and they took yeah. care of the uh, patients and citizens of the state of Mississippi. Tell me, Robert, why should we be concerned, and I mean we, the, the lay people out there from across the state, why should we be concerned and, and uh, at least focus a little bit when we start hearing these people talk about Centene and our medical care? Uh, you know, Paul, Centene uh, is one of the managed care companies mm -hmm. that uh, is under contract with the Division of Medicaid uh, under the managed care organizations uh, and such. Uh, there are some others as well, too. Uh, you know, um, from from what I'm seeing across the country, not only in, in Mississippi, but there are a lot of uh, uh, state attorneys, uh, attorney generals, and uh, state auditors that are looking into some of these managed care organizations uh, and seeing they're they're finding. Uh, double billing or over billing by some of these managed care organizations and so the the, the concern is it's it's taxpayers dollars you know it's yeah. it's it's yeah. it's uh people who are paying taxes uh, in the state of mississippi and these other states uh, that's the important factor do you know if that uh, contract has been re-upped as far as Mississippi's concerned? I, I don't know. I uh, can't give you a definite answer. I saw an article in the paper the yep. other day, uh, maybe a week or two ago, that said I th that uh, I think it is going to be re-upped. I'm, I'm not sure. I, ca I can't give you a, a, a concrete answer well, let me, on that. Let me give you a little bit for the archives. Uh, mm -hmm. Centene already has faced more than $23 million in fines and lost uh, fines and lost incentives over several issues with uh, its performance. Uh, this is when we started looking at the Ohio situation, and Ohio was the first. That is correct. Ohio Department of Medicaid contracts with managed care companies to coordinate health care for about 90% of the people in Ohio, 3 million patients uh, in that program. Uh, and we are about as big here in this state. The companies, in turn, contract with the doctors and the hospitals and other providers. So when you go to talk to somebody in the hospital, they've got a Centene contract uh, with the doctors. They also contract with pharmacy benefit managers. Now, for the layman out there, what is a contract? What is a pharmacy benefit manager? Pharmacy benefit managers are, you know, th these are the guys that are running the prescription drug business. These are the middlemen in between the payer and the pharmacist. And these guys are the, the supplier. Well, they're they're the guys who are kind of behind the curtain, so to speak. And and they don't get an, um, uh, out in the public. A lot of people don't know about them. They're the ones that are trying to say they control drug prices, trying to lower drug prices. And in fact, they are really part of the problem with the prescription drug business and uh, part of the ahead. problem of of why prescription drug drugs are going up. They are known, uh, certainly in the industry, by their acronym. If you ever hear PBMs, they're the PBMs out there. That's correct. The uh, pharmacy benefit managers. Who hires these people? Well, a lot of your uh, employers hire them. Um, you know, you take the state of Mississippi. They they provide insurance to their state employees. Mm -hmm. uh, state of Mississippi, um, you, you know, you'll have someone like a major uh, company. They will hire a pharmacy benefit manager and things like that. And they are the ones who are in between the drug manufacturers, the pharmacists, the employer who pays the bill, yeah. and the uh, the employee, the beneficiary. Pharmacy benefit managers or PBMs fight hard to keep their information about how they determine drug and reimbursement secret. But in the summer of 2018, the Columbus Dispatch obtained confidential information or reimbursement information from about 40 pharmacies. It showed that the two PBMs, CVS Caremark and Optum PX or RX, 
serving Ohio's Medicaid, five managed uh, care organizations, were charging the taxpayer-funded management care companies a lot more for drugs than they were paying the pharmacies that had bought them and dispersed them to the patients. That's correct. Yeah. So after they are putting the pressure on the pharmacies across, I guess, if it plays out, would be Mississippi or Ohio or some of the other places. You know, a lot of times the pharmacy or, or the pharmacist, they get the bad rap because, yeah. you know, Miss um, Smith walks in, she's got a high copay. And the pharmacist is the one that's telling her this this copay is so high. Well, they think that the pharmacist is the one that sets the copay. Well, it's not. It's the PBM yeah. that sets the copay. That that's set before you before you even get the, put it on the shelf. That's correct. They they are in control right here yeah. of what this drug is going to cost and what drugs are on the formulary and everything else like this. They are also telling the doctors how to basically practice medicine as well and what to prescribe as well too. But here's the key to this. This is why. Boom, it blows your mind is when you start investigating you find out some of the people who are at this this organization of PBMs uh, this company is actually owned by people like Centene um, PBM, uh, yes. You you have a lot of vertical. Under a different name? Y- exactly. You have a lot of vertical integration in the PBM market that, that's right That's crazy. Now. It, 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 well, it is a it is a basically a, a spider web. Same thing so going on in the state of Mississippi that's in Ohio. Well. Um, or do we know that? Well, I know there's an investigation going on. By no, the, no, I'm talking about the structure. Oh. Uh, is dissenting. Do, do the PMs that direct the amount of uh, – that set the prices here in Mississippi, or is it the same company that uh, is doing it in Ohio that's owned by Centene? Basic, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Close relationship between Buckeye and Evolve. Both are owned by St. Louis-based Centene, which represents 13% of Americans enrolled in the Medicaid Managed Care Plan. That makes Centene number 42 – On Forbes Fortune 500, the largest Medicaid managed care company in the United States of America, Buckeye paid Evolve $321 million for drugs while Evolve passed along about $301 million of that to to CVS Caremark, which passed along uh, $268 million of that to the pharmacies that had actually purchased and dispensed the drug. Everybody's feeding off of it. Before you guys get what you what it, uh, the actual cost is, the pharmacists are the the ones who are doing all of the work, taking care of the patients. Yeah. And this is and the, this is the thing that we're going to re up without even looking at it, waiting till the investigation is over. Uh, more about this uh, coming up uh, in just a moment. Just going back on a recap of an earlier story, the state auditor and Mississippi Attorney General are investigating whether Centene Corporation, as a provider of Medicaid drug services, failed to disclose discounts on pharmacy services, inflating dispensing costs, received reimbursements for amounts already paid. Between 16 and 20, the state Medicaid program paid Centene more than $1.1 billion for pharmacy services. Uh, I've never been able to figure this out. It is $222 million is what the contract said for administrative cost. And then ultimately, with uh, apparently, if you, if you save money, and again, I think the, the analogy, and Robert Dozier is my guest, Executive Director of Mississippi Independent Pharmacies, the, the analogy given to me is like, a, um, is like an insurance company. The more claims you turn down, the more profit you're going to make. And, and basically... What the managed care was supposed to do in our state, and it really failed to do, was to cut the health insurance cost by helping make people uh, healthier. I haven't seen that. The ratings that they took, the over of uh, the overview of the study by the peer committee, everyone looks at it and says it's not working. Couldn't we take two hundred and twenty-two million dollars administratively, bring it in house? I, I agree, Paul. Have yeah. you been? How long have you been uh, at this position? Seventeen years. Okay. Was um, was that a little before we went to managed care? Correct. Yes, sir. Do you remember it then? Yes, and and was I, the situation a lot better for pharmacies? It, yes, and I, and I'll say this, Paul. I've uh, our association has been saying that we need to carve mm-hmm. pharmacy out of managed care. 
because the Division of Medicaid has a great staff over there within the pharmacy department. They do a good job. They, they, they're they doing all of the work as far as pharmacy is concerned, yeah. and and we, we have these three managed care companies over here um, not really doing a whole lot of, uh, of work when it comes to pharmacy, and they are supposed to produce healthier outcomes. Yeah. And that's the goal here, and also budget uh, predictability. Well, you know, have we saved any money with managed care? I, I don't know. I don't know if anybody has that answer. And then you also have the other question is, what about the healthy outcomes? Well, you just said right yeah. there uh, from your report that the, we're at the same spot. I think we were talking about it yesterday, too, and uh, in talking to some of the doctors at the medical clinic uh have we made people healthier it's doubtful certainly in some of the poorest rural areas of the state uh there are not a lot of people who have decreased who've dropped off of the program as far as medicaid's concern uh looking at, at that particular part of it the the other part of this is when you talk about pulling pharmacies out if you've got some people listening from centene they kind of laugh at that because that's their cash cow well, you, you know, right now, uh, recently, earlier this week, there was a Wall Street Journal article that's, that's uh, kind of going off of this investigation that's going in, uh, going on in Ohio. Yeah. By the the gentleman who's the current uh, attorney general in Ohio, and he was also the state uh, auditor at one time, and he started this investigation in Ohio. And so, what we're seeing right now, currently, I think there's about seven states across the country that are doing a similar investigation, from what I can tell. Um, How many states? Seven. Seven, seven, seven states. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think it's uh, it's Ohio, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Georgia, New Mexico, Kansas, and Arkansas mm. right now. So, these people made a total of one hundred eleven billion dollars in twenty twenty. That's one hundred eleven billion dollars off of of the health care and Medicaid across the country and all the states that they represent. I can assure you the independent pharmacists did not make that. $111 billion. So there are a lot of lobbyists on down that are making money before the uh, before the people walk into the pharmacy. You know, Paul, here's the thing. You, you have doctors, pharmacists, nurses, and everything. Yeah. They're the health care providers. They, they are the ones who are taking care of the patients out there. Um, you, you know, my the independent pharmacists that I represent are some of the best health care providers uh, out there. And, and they want to be in a position to take care of the the patient and provide the adequate health care yeah. that they deserve. And, and at the same time, uh, receive a fair reimbursement. But when you start talking about these uh, managed care organizations and pharmacy benefit managers steadily cutting away at the reimbursement and everything and paying pharmacists below their cost on prescriptions, and at the same time, they're reaping all of these uh, corporate uh, profits that you just read. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I think just to make it easy for a lot of people who don't understand when they talk about managed care, it's just like if we were politicians in here and all of a sudden we had to, all of these people, 730,000 people on Medicaid, uh, is our agency, is our government going to be able to handle this and process it and, and, and do all the paperwork and, and, and uh, be able to, to, to take care of the, the communication between the doctors and the pharmacies, what needs to be done, is this x-ray okay, and all of this stuff. It's a lot, it's, it's a lot of stuff that goes on. Mm -hmm. So then they say, well, you know what, I don't think our agency is going to be able to handle this, so let's just go to outside. Let's privatize it, or let's just subcontract, and that's where the managed care comes in, and some private entity is supposed to handle all that, right? Is that is that a simple explanation? Well, that's that's it. it sounds good in theory. Yeah, but I didn't say I didn't say it was workable. But well, I mean, that's the format. You know, and and I'm only going to talk about pharmacy right here. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing: before managed care, pharmacy was all handled by the division of Medicaid. Yeah. Okay. So right now, currently today, you have seventy percent of the Medicaid population that is being controlled by managed care. The other thirty percent is traditional Medicaid. So the individual, the, the staff... Wait a minute, back up. How do you separate traditional Medicaid from non-traditional? Well, you have 70% of the Medicaid population is under um, the managed care plans. 
um, within the managed care organization. Then you have the other thirty percent that's for that's in the fee for service. Okay, that's just no, that's it. they're not in the managed care or, uh, plans. So right now you have this thirty percent that is being looked at by the uh, the division of Medicaid. Mm-hmm. So the the individuals in the pharmacy department they're looking at this thirty percent, and then also they also have to make sure that the MCOs are basically doing their job. MCOs managed care, care organizations oh, that the MCOs are basically doing their job on this other 70%. So the pharmacy department, they're they're doing two jobs. They're doing their job, then they're also basically kind of like policing the MCOs, making sure they do their jobs. So why are we working them <laughs> and, and making them do two, two jobs? Why don't we just take this 70% and put it all back uh, over there at the uh, pharmacy department, let them handle it? Yeah. Because a lot, of, a lot of what's going on in, in pharmacy today with Medicaid is governed by CMS, the, the, the federal government. Uh, Robert, how did your organization, how did it view the, the possibility? Of, was it better or worse, or, or no comment on the Mississippi True Care? Uh, we we don't have a, a comment on that right there. Yep. Um, you know, I'd, I'd I'd like to sit down with the uh, hospital association and talk with them a little bit about that and um, see where we go from. What do you think the Medicaid expansion would do if you had another two hundred or three hundred thousand people? You know, that's that's going to be a topic for uh, for my board members to to uh, talk about later this month, right here. Because you know, I, I, I would imagine Centene would be happy about that. <laughs> well, I don't know. I can't speak for them. The in 2016, the legislature authorized examination of the performance of uh, managed care companies. This is five years ago now. The, the report concluded that 54 out of the 68 categories that they were checking, Magnolia and United failed to meet or only partially met requirements. The report recommended lawmakers order an in-depth study to evaluate the cost of managed care or Mississippi CAN C A N program. St. Louis-based company ranks among the nation's 10 biggest health care corporations uh, in the USA. Final thoughts? You know, um, Paul, I, I think I think people need to maybe kind of slow down a little bit, look and see what's going on across the nation with these investigations, uh, with the state auditors and the attorney generals, and uh, just see what happens after that. Have you heard any update at all? Uh, as far as the Mississippi investigation? No, yeah, as or, far as our investigation. No, sir, I have not. Um, I'm pretty much, you know, learning everything through news articles yeah. just like you and everybody else. So we haven't heard anything from them either side. And, and it's one of those things that you have to have a lot of data. you got to ask for as much information as you can. There's a lot of lawyers in between, I'm sure. There are things that Centene are going to just wait until they have to to provide. So it, it's not one of those things that happens overnight. We understand that. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it, it's probably going to be a while. But that said, um, you know, the legislative session is coming up, and, and uh, are we uh, – is it prudent to go on and sign that contract? You, you know, Paul, I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen the contract. You know, the, the details are always in the contract yep. and such. Yep. So, you know – yeah. All right. Also, um, uh, always good to uh, talk to you. Robert Dozier, Executive Director, Mississippi Independent Pharmacy.